Welcome to CBA Speaks. My name is Barry Schneider. I had the privilege this afternoon of hosting Michael Michonne. W welcome, Michael. Michael Michonne is a native New Yorker. In 1906, he was appointed by Borough President Scott Stringer to be the Manhattan Borough Historian. For the past 20 years, Mr. Michonne has fought to raise awareness for Andrew Haswell Green, the unsung city planner who is the mastermind of the consolidation of today's five borough city. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Barry. I hate to interrupt you, yes, but I'm sir. not quite that old. I was appointed in 2006. Which was, did I say 19? You said 1906, well, which would be right around the era that I study. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, we're back to 2006. Now it's 2019. Mike, in about 10 seconds, who was Andrew Haswell Green? And why does he deserve to have a park named after him? Right. So Andrew Green was a, a 19th century master planner, reformer, and preservationist. And I like to say he helped make New York City the world-class city that it is today. Tell us about yourself, Mike. You're the officially the Manhattan Borough historian. Most New Yorkers probably have never heard of such a position. Tell us about the job, and please tell us a little about yourself. To begin with myself, I am a native New Yorker. I was born in Brooklyn. Uh, I currently live in Manhattan. And uh, I've lived here basically my whole life. Uh, I got started interested in history working for the city's television station. And uh, so much so that I really, really became extremely passionate about this. And uh, when I realized that there would be an opening for the position of borough historian, I applied for it. And I was appointed after several interviews by the borough president. Uh, now, the borough historian is a position that exists in each of the boroughs, as well as in all the municipalities in New York State. It's basically a position created by the state legislature. And uh, the way it works for New York City, we don't have one city historian. We have five borough historians. Now, the position was created in the 1920s and the 1930s. And the way it's described, it's basically the guy who collects all the artifacts and keeps the records of the town. And of course, in New York City, we don't need to do that. A borough historian doesn't need to do that. There are the Municipal Archives, the New York Historical Society, the New York Public Library, all sorts of mechanisms for doing that job. And so it basically makes me and my other borough historian counterparts history boosters. And one of the probably the most valuable thing we do is we answer questions from the media and from the public about city history. Now, I'll be the first one to admit I don't know everything about city history, but I know a lot of people and together they know a lot. And so oftentimes people will ask me a question. If I can answer it, I'm happy to do that. But if I know somebody who's the true expert on that topic, I'll put them together, the question with the answer. And that's uh, that's. Uh, a large part of what I do. I also have my other passions and interests, and Andrew Green is one of them. Well, how did you get started studying, becoming compassionate, obsess obsessing, if I may, about Andrew Green? Well, back in the uh, 1990s, I worked for the city's television station, was then called Crosswalks. And uh, I pitched to my boss the idea of doing a documentary about the consolidation of the boroughs. We were just about a year away from the 100th anniversary of the 1898 consolidation of the five boroughs. And this, of course, is a crucial part of New York history, but a fairly unknown part of New York history. And I figured, let me tell this story and in the process learn about it myself, because I didn't know much myself. And in the process of creating that documentary, I learned about Andrew Green, who's considered the father of greater New York, the father of the consolidation movement. But that's just scratching the surface. It's the tip of the iceberg. He had a 50-year career, and the consolidation was just one piece of it. Can you tell me how Andrew Green got started on his career? Yeah, so he unfortunately was not a New Yorker. He was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, and like so many young men in New England in the early 1800s, he came down to the big city. He worked as a dry goods clerk, and but eventually found his passion in the law. And he made his way as the apprentice uh, and the protege of a very prominent New York City attorney, Samuel Tilden, uh, who would play a very important role in democratic politics. And eventually he became Samuel Tilden's law partner. 
in these democratic circles that he traveled in uh, and his interest in sort of civic betterment, he found himself uh, appointed to a very, very important position, uh, the Board of Commissioners of the Central Park. I'll just call it the Central Park Commission. And the Central Park Commission was tasked with the job of designing and creating Central Park. And that was really the springboard uh, for a phenomenal career. Now, many people think that Central Park uh, was created by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Fox, which is true. These folks were, these guys, this team, uh, were the partners that designed the park. But Andrew Green was their boss, oh. basically. And Andrew Green, as part of this commission, eventually rose to lead this commission. And one of the things the commission had to do very early on was to choose a plan for the design of the park. And they had a competition. There were 33 proposals, 33 different designs. And Andrew Green instantly saw the genius of the Green's Word plan, which is the plan that Olmsted and Vox submitted. And he kind of persuaded his allies within the commission to approve that plan and not other competing plans. And so Andrew Green was responsible for getting that plan decided. And boy, oh boy, what a good idea that was. Green didn't have much to do with the design of the park, but he had everything to do with making sure that design was executed. Uh, he was an ally of Olmsted and Vox. In the early years, they were all very close and friendly, but I have to say that the relationship deteriorated. Uh, Olmsted was a very artistic man, a little bit of a spendthrift. Uh, Andrew Green uh, was uh, made sure that the project stayed on schedule and on budget. Mm. And they often conflicted uh, over monetary issues and deadlines and that sort of thing. Uh, but it is generally agreed by all observers and historians that the creation of Central Park was one of the outstanding achievements of that era. It was a monumental project thousands of workers, millions of dollars, 15 years, basically, to get the park built. And Green was the guy who always made sure that it was done efficiently, honestly, uh, and like I said, on budget and on schedule. Because the Central Park Commission did, su did such a good job of getting Central Park created, it was soon given more authority to do more things that needed to be done. Can you tell time. us what some of those things were? Sure. The first thing, the first expansion of the Central Park Commission's authority was planning northern Manhattan. Uh, many of us city residents uh, know about the street grid of Manhattan Island, where we have streets and avenues running perpendicular to each other. That street grid was essentially designed and approved in 1811. It's called the 1811 Commissioner's Plan. But what a lot of people don't realize is that plan only went up to 155th Street. It stopped there. Beyond that, it was left blank. And the commissioners uh, felt that, well, development will never reach up there for centuries to come, centuries to come. Well, sure enough, half a century after the plan uh, was devised, uh, development was, was scratching at the door of northern Manhattan. And so the Central Park Commission, with Andrew Green at the head, was given the job of planning the streets above 155th Street. Now, that's very tough territory. If you know the topography of it, it's very rocky, very hilly, steep cliffs, very difficult terrain. And Green realized you can't just impose that orderly perpendicular grid there uh, because it just wouldn't work in such hilly terrain. And so. If you look at the map of Northern Manhattan above 155th Street, it's this kind of hybrid mm. of organic street planning where the streets run where they would run naturally because of the terrain and the grid. So it's a combination of both those things. They were later given authority to replan the Upper West Side. The Green gave us Riverside Park, Morningside Park, uh, Fort Washington Park, uh, straightened out Broadway. Uh, it used to be kind of a wiggly waggly street. Now it's a straight boulevard. And after that, they were 
asked for recommendations for planning what is today the Bronx, what was then Lower Westchester County. And uh, that led to ideas that I'll say eventually led to the consolidation. In your study of Andrew Green, what kind of man was he? He was kind of a little bit of a fuddy-duddy, I must admit. Uh, very smart man, very sharp man, very honest man. Uh, everyone knew that he was a straight shooter. Uh, and this was an era of giant scandals, as you may know, lots of corruption and things like that. He was a very hard worker. Even Frederick Law Olmsted, as I said, who grew to dislike Andrew Green very much, said he does a hundred times more work than any of the, than all of the other commissioners put together. He was not into any vices. He didn't drink. He didn't gamble. He wasn't what was known as a sporting man, enjoying the races and things like that. But by the same token, uh, while he was sort of your classic uh, New England Yankee lawyer, um, he, he wasn't overtly religious either. He 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 had he had a, a a moral compass, but he wasn't an overtly religious man uh, either. Did he have a family? Did he have descendants? He did not have a family. He never married, and so he never had direct descendants. Uh, the Green family was very large, uh, and occasionally I'll meet a member of the Green family who'll say, oh, I'm Andrew Green's great-great-grandson. Uh, and I always have to break their heart and say, well, you may be his great-great-grandnephew, mm -hmm. but you're not his great-grandson because he never had direct descendants. Uh -huh. We know of his successes. Uh, you didn't mention, for example, the Metropolitan Museum of Art was one of his. Can you tell us about that? Right. Uh, he, he was... Uh, instrumental in creating uh, some great world-class institutions, world-class institutions. Um, for example, he envisioned Central Park as being sort of the center of the, the growing city's uh, educational and cultural institutions. And so uh, when he knew that there was an opportunity to create an art museum, uh, he partnered with what would be the trustees of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and said, hey, look, you've got a collection of great artwork. I can build you a building to put that collection in. We'll call it the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The city, the government will own your structure. You will own and manage the collection within. And boom, the Metropolitan Museum of Art was born. Same thing for the American Museum of Natural History. Later in his career, he would be instrumental in creating uh, the New York Zoological Society, which most of us know as the Bronx Zoo, but has since expanded around the world as the Wildlife Conservation Society, around the world, right? And uh, the other great institution he had a hand in later in his life was the New York Public Library. Uh, many people know the New York Public Library um, was sort of launched by Samuel Tilden, his one-time law partner and good friend, and after Tilden died, uh, Tilden wanted a library, a public library for the city he lived in. And Green and others who were his executors were tasked with creating that library. Now, creating that library was, I call it a civic soap opera with all sorts of intrigue and backpedaling and lawsuits and scandals oh. and whatever have you. But they got the job done. Yeah. Did he have any failures? Uh, he did have a couple of failures. Uh, one of the things he envisioned for Central Park was another museum, a Paleozoic Museum. In the 1860s, it was all the rage to find fossils and create reproductions of these beasts that lived long ago. And he invited a naturalist from England, a world famous naturalist from England to come over and to create some of these uh, these great uh, extinct beasts, cast them out of plaster and concrete. And he began to do that uh, at approximately the west side at about 63rd Street within the park. The Central Park Commission came to an end in approximately 1870 when there was a, a charter revision that did away with the commission and the Tweed Ring, which we might talk yeah, about yeah. later, basically took control of the city and its finances. And they didn't like Andrew Green and they didn't like this Paleozoic Museum. And so they very quickly sent some guys over there to, to smash 
the museum and these uh, the, 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 the animals and uh, bury them somewhere in the park. It's still a grand mystery as to where exactly these creatures are. The other, the other uh, project that never came to be, I want to mention, uh, Green had a vision of creating a bridge across the Hudson River, right? And this was in the 1890s. The bridge never came to pass for all sorts of reasons. But it's interesting to note that if that bridge had been built, we would not be here right now because the entrance to that bridge is approximately where this television studio is <laughs> at 59th Street on the far west side. Oh, yeah. Fascinating. In all the years that you've done research on Mr. Green, uh, do you have any, did you make any discoveries? Quite a number. Uh, a lot of them would interest only historians like myself. Well, one of them that I, I think is, is quite interesting and colorful, uh, I'll tell you about. On the 50th anniversary of the consolidation, which would be 1948, the city had held an exposition. It was called the Golden Jubilee, golden being 50-year anniversary. Um, and the Golden Jubilee was a three-part celebration in the summer of 1948. Uh, there was a grand parade down Fifth Avenue, celebration of municipal uh, offices and departments. Uh, there was an air show at what would eventually become JFK Airport. It was in the process of being built. And there was an exposition at the Grand Central Palace, which was the kind of pre-Coliseum, pre-Javits Center exposition space in the city. And the entrance to the exposition hall had a eight-foot-tall plaster statue of Andrew Green. Now, I set about trying to find out if that thing still exists. And so after a lot of phone calls and inquiries to friends and colleagues, I learned uh, about the man who had created the statue, a guy named Carl Gruppi. He was no longer alive, but I was eventually put in touch with his daughter who lived all the way up in Maine. And I got in touch with her and I told her the story and I asked her if she knew about the statue and she said no. And I said, well, I would like one day to come up there and look through your dad's records, which she said she had, to see if there are any hints as to whatever became of this statue. After quite a number of months, I was visiting a friend up in Maine, and I said to her, hey, I'm coming up to Maine. Tell you what, let me go through those boxes in your attic, save you the trouble. And she goes, oh, that would be great. And when you come here, we can go in the garage and open up some of the crates of dad's old statues. Huh. See what's in there. And I was like, dad's old statues? Sure. And so we went up there and we started cracking open these boxes. And sure enough, didn't find the eight foot tall Andrew Green, but we found the two smaller versions of the statue, one about 32 inches tall and another one smaller than that, about eight inches tall. Mm -hmm. And she was so generous. Uh, she actually gave me the statues. And it's my hope and dream one day to have those statues reproduced and placed in the public sphere somewhere. Fascinating. You mentioned Pope and Boss Tweed. Is there any other more story of, in, involving Andrew Green and his inter interaction with Tweed? Absolutely. So after the, <clears throat> the Tweed charter uh, essentially eliminated the Central Park Commission, Tweed and his cronies took over the city. And after only a couple of years, the evidence of their chicanery uh, became apparent. And uh, Samuel Tilden, Green's friend and associate, sort of led the charge against the Tweed Ring. They obtained some irrefutable evidence of the corruption that was going on and helped bring the Tweed Ring down. Now, Andrew Green, who had experience as being the controller uh, of the Central Park Commission, was eventually placed in the position of controller of the city of New York. And so he was able to take control of the city finances. He realized that the city was on the brink of bankruptcy after what the Tweed Ring had done. And he set about sort of writing the finances, getting the city uh, back on sound fiscal footing. In the process of doing that, he actually took out a loan to meet the payroll of the city using his own credit. Uh, he went to bankers who trusted him. Um, you know, trust them without a doubt. And he said, look, I need this amount of money and uh, use my own, my own good name to vouch for the fact that you'll get paid for it. And they said, well, if it's, if it's you, Andy, mm. here, they wrote him a check and he was able to meet the payroll for the city. Yes, yeah. wonderful. Going back to the consolidation of the borough, I mean, that made New York the city that it is without question. And tell us a little more about the, his role in the sure. consolidation. The consolidation uh, story sort of picks up 
um, in the late 1880s. In the late 1880s, uh, New York City, as it has been for most of its history, was a incredibly important port city. The harbor, the port of New York drove the economy of the whole area. And there were problems with the port. It was being mismanaged at the time uh, because New York City consisted only of Manhattan Island and the port doesn't just have Manhattan. It also has parts of Brooklyn, parts of Staten Island, even parts of Queens. What we call these right, boroughs right, right now. now, of course, they weren't that back then. They were a patchwork of different uh, towns and villages and cities. And so the business community in the city realized that something needs to be done to, to sort of better manage the port. So Andrew Green, who had an idea way back when he was planning northern Manhattan, uh, he had difficulty planning uh, the bridges across the Harlem River from northern Manhattan to lower Westchester County. Couldn't get the officials to agree on agree where those bridges would be, where the streets that led to those bridges would be, who would pay for these improvements, right? And so he had an idea way back in 1868. Why don't we dissolve these municipal boundaries, create one big city that will encompass all the municipalities so instead of being rivals, will be partners, right? And that idea never got traction back, back in the 1860s. But in the 1880s, when there was trouble with the port, he kind of came back up with this idea. And the business community thought it would be a good idea. And so they kind of supported it. And so Andrew Green sort of led the movement to get this consolidation concept done. Now, the consolidation is a very long and arduous 10-year process. And I like to say it went through three phases. It went through the city planning phase when Andrew Green was kind of in charge, and then it kind of got out of his hands. It became a, a, a cultural phase when people sort of looked into themselves and decided what kind of identity did they want. Did they want to be a New Yorker or did they want to be a Brooklynite or a resident of Long Island City or some other part of the hinterlands around Manhattan. And so there was a cultural fight. And then eventually it became a political fight. And another character enters the scene here who really takes the work that Andrew Green did to get this started and takes the work of those other uh, cultural commentators uh, that they did to move the consolidation notion forward to all of these non-New Yorkers. And then this political guy, his name was Thomas Collier Platt. He was a Republican party boss. This was one of those brief periods when the Republican party dominated New York politics. And he decided it would be a good idea for his party uh, to push consolidation through. And that's what he managed to do. And so, yeah, this was, uh, this, this was quite a, quite a quite story. <laughs> Thank you so much. In addition to being a planner and a consolidator, uh, you also mentioned he's a preservationist. How so? Yeah. So this was something that came to him late in his life. Uh, Green was a great student of history, and he was also a great admirer of uh, scenic and natural spaces. I mean, park building mm -hmm. uh, was one of the things he did, not just here in the city, not just Central Park and those other parks I mentioned in northern Manhattan, but he was also largely responsible for creating the state park at Niagara Falls, for example. And so um, late in his life, he decided uh, after having a tussle uh, with the folks who were trying to help him or fight him creating the New York Public Library over the fate of City Hall, the building, mm. uh, because there was discussion of tearing that building down, replacing it with a larger munis municipal building, and then repurposing the City Hall building and turning it into what would oh. be the New York Public Library. And this idea incredibly inf offended Andrew Green, and he fought his partners, his fellow, um, fellow Tilden trustees, who thought that was a good idea. And eventually Green won, uh, but this got him on a path of historic preservation. He created an organization called the American Scenic and Historic Preservation Society. It was the first formal historic preservation society in the state, arguably in the nation. And they created parks 
uh, which are now state parks. Uh, they also created historic sites, which are now state historic sites or city historic sites. Um, eventually, they were dissolved and um, municipalities like the state and the city and other and even the federal government took over a lot of these uh, these parks and, and historic sites that they were the ones that that really uh, got got started. So, and the, the work of the American Scenic and Historic Preservation Society uh, outlived Andrew Green uh, by several decades. Oh, yeah. Good. Tell us how he died. Yeah, Green had a had a kind of a tragic, sad death. Uh, he lived to be quite an elderly man into his early 80s. And when he was coming home from his office one day, he lived at Park Avenue and 39th Street, he was approached by a stranger who shot him to death. Make a long story short, it was a case of mistaken identity. The man who, who killed him uh, thought he was some other elderly white uh, gentleman who looked like Andrew Green. That other man was having a relationship with a woman of questionable morals. <laughs> and uh, this man, who was kind of obsessed with that woman, thought that that man and the woman were sort of sp spreading scandalous rumors about him. And, and he was a little deranged. He was never, he was, uh, rather than being tried, he was actually sent to an institution for the mentally, the criminally insane. Tell me this, why so few people know of Andrew Haswell Green? Excellent question. I would say one reason is that because he died in this sort of cloud of mystery, because untangling exactly what was going on with his death made people question whether or not Andrew Green was in fact the straight shooter and choir oh. boy that everyone thought he was. Was he really, you know, hanging around with this kept woman that this this man was uh, was truly targeting? And uh, w and so I think uh, a lot of his uh, reputation took a hit in those until it was finally figured mm -hmm. out. And by then, about six months later, uh, Andrew Green was old news. Uh, plus, he was from another era. I mean, he, he, he lived a long and successful life, but the city was, I mean, with the consolidation, the city was was expanding like crazy. And new heroes were coming on the scene. Um, plus, he was a fairly modest guy, and so uh, he, the folks, uh, his peers and admirers, never really sought to have a large, grand monument uh, uh -huh. built in his name, although there were ideas to do that. Uh, beside the park on the East River, the Andrew yeah. Haswell Green Park, right. are there any other monuments? A few. There's a bench in Central Park, which is the official Andrew Green Memorial Bench. It's uh, very hard to find in, northern, in the northern Central Park. Uh, uh, spaces. It was originally built with five memorial trees around it, uh, intended to represent the five boroughs. Uh, the trees eventually die. They succumb to Dutch elm disease. Uh, but one of the first things I did in Andrew Green's memory was to get the Parks Department to replant those trees. So now there are five trees up there around the bench. There's a portrait of him in City Hall. And there's an island named for him up near Niagara Falls, because like I said, he was responsible largely for, for creating and managing the Niagara Falls uh, State Park up there. In brief, how would you characterize his vision for a greater New York today? Uh, that's a great question, because there was a lot of the proponents of the consolidation had big plans for for greater New York, the five boroughs, right? And I would say growing up in the city, having been a Brooklynite myself, lots of folks who live in the outer boroughs probably never felt those big plans ever really materialized for them, right? It was all about Manhattan. But right now, I think we're starting to really see in a big way, a realization of a greater New York. The prosperity, the development, uh, even, even just the tourist traffic is bursting off the island of Manhattan into these other neighborhoods in Brooklyn and in Queens and up in the Bronx. Staten Island is still waiting. <laughs> they got to get that, that Ferris wheel built, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, they're starting to see some of the action that Manhattan has always seen. And so it may be late in coming, but I think the promise of greater New York I is upon us. I hope we can do our part by getting this message out to more and more people who will understand and revere and visit the park 
at 60th Street and the East River. Thank you. Michael, a pleasure having you here this evening. Good to see you. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, I'm Michael Michonne, the Manhattan Borough Historian, and it was my pleasure to speak with Barry Schneider, my colleague, uh, who interviewed me about one of my heroes, Andrew Haswell Green. Uh, Mr. Green has recently had a park named for him on the east side of Manhattan, uh, and he and I talked about why he deserves that park and deserves to be recognized by all the residents of New York City, even those Brooklynites who opposed the consolidation of the five boroughs when Andrew Green proposed it way back in the 1890s. Uh, fortunately, Andrew Green uh, won the day, and we now have a five borough city, which includes Brooklyn and Manhattan and the Bronx, Staten Island, and Queens. And I think that the five borough city is a testament uh, to the good planning vision of Andrew Green and others. I was delighted to be able to participate in this discussion about Andrew Haswell Green with borough historian Michael Michonne. I've, heard, I've known of Andrew Green through Michael for many, many years now, and Mike has always lamented that there is no proper memorial or space in the city that honors Andrew Haswell Green. My role in the community board back in 2006 involved a committee called the 197A Committee, that designation 197A is the chapter in the city charter that allows community groups like community boards to tell the city agency, city and the city agency how they'd like their community planned. And at the, at the time, these, the East River heliport at 60th Street had been closed due to a fatal accident some years before, and the land was just sitting idle and fallow. The city had no plans for it. So a group of us on the community board, Helene Simon, who's no longer with us, Judy Schneider, my wife and myself, and several others got together, organized the 197A committee, and said, let's say, we, let's say we can make a park at the East River, because Community District 8 is bereft of parks. We have one, one of the least amounts of open space in the city. And so if we can make a public park where a heliport had been, it would be a great asset to the community and a benefit to all the residents here. So the long story short, the 197A plan from 2nd Avenue and 59th and 6th Street East to the river and north to 63rd Street was approved by city council in 2006. Sometime later, a development was going on further upland, and the developer had to make a, a, a mitigation factor to the community, and that mitigation was to do something in the park. So they were going to fund the park at the waterfront. At that time, we suggested that Michael get in touch with the city commissioner of parks, Adrian Benepe, and pitch him on the idea of having the park named for Andrew Haswell Green. The long story short, several years after, the Andrew Haswell Green Park came into being as a result of the efforts of Michael and Adrian Benepe. And that's, a, that's the end of my story. Thank you.